Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the latest installment of AF, AAF's Thought Leadership Series. I'm Lorraine Conte Vasquez, Executive Vice President of Multicultural Markets at AARP. And we're coming to you live from AARP studio in Washington, DC. AARP is proud to partner with the American Advertising Federation in today's uh, intelligence panel, a boomer's perspective on multicultural brand messaging and media content. I'd like to start with a heartfelt thanks to our sponsors, Draft FCB, Leo Burnett, McCann, World Group, Omnicon Group, and RPA. We're truly grateful for your support. And a sincere thanks to all of you in the audience and our satellite audience and our host sites, DGB Latina in Miami, RPA in Los Angeles, Fitzgerald and Company in Atlanta, Columbia College in Chicago, and CNN in New York. We have assembled an amazing panel of experts who will share their research and insights about America's most important and fastest growing demographic. They will reintroduce you to the Boomba cohort and let you know the secret is why some of these, some people refer to this generation as the golden boomers. So let's jump right in and have our panel introduce themselves. Emilio. Thank you, uh, Lorraine. My name is Emilio Pardo. I am the Chief Brand Officer for AARP. Hello, my name is Sharon Pinello. I am a strategist at McCann Erickson, New York, um, where our team focuses mostly on social media for big brands such as MasterCard, American Airlines, and Kohl's. Um, I'm also a first-generation Filipino-American who grew up in Germany and the Deep South, so looking at the way culture shifts around the world is a big passion of mine, so I'm very excited to be here. Hi. <coughs> Hi, I'm Stephen Hirsch. I'm a strategist at Leo Burnett Company in Chicago. Good afternoon. I'm Jim Lucas. I work at Draft FCB, where I do work on a globally on retail strategy and insights, so very much interested in how shoppers think about things and behave. Hi, I'm Marjorie Chua. I'm Miami-based with Alma DDB, part of DDB Latina. As you can all tell, I'm a foreign-born person uh, from Argentina, living in Miami for a long time. Hi, my name is Doug Harris. I'm the CEO of Kaleidoscope Group, which is a full-service diversity and inclusion consulting firm uh, headquartered in Chicago. Do a lot of work in all areas of diversity and very excited to be here. Hi, my name is Chuck Schroeder, a senior creative people. I'm a copywriter and partner. Our group was formed uh, from art directors and, and uh, copywriters from the Doyle Dane Burnback creative team from the 1960s. I'm the eldest here today and uh, very interested in what these experts have to say. Well, Chuck, as our elder statesman, why don't we ask, start with you and have you define a boomers for us and also share with us what are some of the characteristics that distinguish this generation from others? Well, I'd like to say that um, I'm the definition of a boomer, but I'm a couple of years too old. So I've been through the, the rite of passage and um, one of the things that, that interests me as a, as a creative person and as a, as a senior is the way that um, the boomers are going to begin to understand what it means to be called a boomer or a senior. They're very familiar now with, uh, with the term boomer. They may not be familiar with how the term senior rings in your ear as you get older. And sometimes that ring is not all that impl impressive and, uh, and all not, not all that uh, pleasant. And one of the things that is, as I say, as a creative person that I look to and watch very carefully is messaging. I've been in the advertising business a long time, and I'm very interested in the way marketers uh, uh, succeed and fail to address seniors appropriately in a language they understand and also with respect. Thank you. You know what, I'm going to turn to you, Emilio, so that we can talk a little bit about messaging and language, because I think that will frame this whole conversation. Well, you're absolutely right. Uh, language is absolutely primordial when you're looking at a boomer population, but there are a couple of myths that we need to sort of level set here. There, the boomer is not a monolithic group, as all of us know, right? There's the older boomer, and then there's a younger boomer. The 55-year-old today, which is considered a younger boomer, is dramatically different than the older boomer. But however, there is a constance throughout the entire generation, which is language. Uh, so we did a study a few months ago. We were struggling with what is the new language that we need to use in order to connect and make that frame happen. 
And the study was called, when we're going into the study, the new language of aging. When we were done, it was the new language of living. <laughs> Therein lies the shift of a boomer mentality. It is about living, not about aging. Doesn't mean that we're not about aging issues, but you're living through that frame. And if the marketeers and the communicators don't get the frame right, it doesn't matter how many tactics we use, the boomers are going to turn off. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the struggle that, that now uh, lies in front of the, of, of the population watching us. How do you frame it differently? And lastly, the boomers have changed the way they live life, right? I mean, they came on to age, and you know, adolescence category was really put in place by the boomer generation as they became uh, um, uh, of age. Well, there's a whole new life stage forming, somewhere between working and this thing called retirement. Boomers either can't retire, don't want to retire, or retire but are still working. And what is that, that middle stage, and what is that language? And it's that curve that is not the upside down U curve that we're probably familiar with the way you live your life. And you know, you get to your retirement age, you get the gold watch, and then you go retire and you expire. Now, right about 48, 49 years old, there's that question, what's next? What do I do now? And boomers are right on that, on that upward curve, and then it dips down until the end. But is that S lying across curve not an upside down U? If you're a marketeer, and you're marketing to the old frame, you will not get the hearts, and in this case, the wallets of the, of the boomer population. Very interesting point. So you started talking about segments, and one of the things is that people do start thinking of boomers in this monolithic way. I would ask you, Doug, and also Martha, please feel free to chime in, but this whole notion of diversity, inclusion, multicultural, and all of those words that people use interchangeably, and sometimes yeah. they may not be, so I would love to hear your perspective on that, that aspect of the market. Thank you. Uh, a couple of things come to mind. It's interesting, too. I was just listening to Emilio and thinking about the power of boomers. And so there's been language around aging for a long time. But once we start to age, we can change the language. <laughs> you see what I'm so it's very dynamic how it's a powerful group. It's and a pioneering, it's pioneering a aspect. Pioneering of element of who we are. And, and those changes have been taking place throughout our lives. When we get there, it's like, let's look at it a new way. And so that's a, co a powerful component of boomers. But I think when you look at diversity and boomers, it's important that we look at it as a slice of who people are. And so for myself, I look at the word identity. So diversity means difference. And then identity means you pull out the differences that are important to you, which say who you are. So you start to rank them either consciously or unconsciously. Mm -hmm. So for me, ethnicity still is maybe at a higher level of importance than generation. But that's just me. It doesn't mean mm -hmm. that's for everyone. Mm -hmm. And so when we start to look at this term of diversity, we mean many dimensions. But how do people lean into them? We have different ways of seeing the world. So, but if you disrespect any part of our identity, that's an issue. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So I may not be my main one, but if I hear something, if someone asks me, are you going to retire? I'm like, hey, hey, I'm not ready yet. <laughs> so you know, you can still have some feelings in that arena. And then I think when we look at culture, it's becoming that more all-encompassing word that, al that allows all the parts of us to be in existence and be recognized. So it doesn't cut us, cut, up, cut us up as much, but we're just a holistic form. And so I think language is important, like diversity and multiculturalism, but I think it's also important to understand us as individuals. Right, and talking about this growing explosion of Latino market, and yes. you've been in that arena, Martha. What did yeah, you talking about language precisely, mm -hmm. and a different kind of language, although it's not the ruling thing. I totally agree with that. It is a more of a layered kind of identity, and we are all in agreement that boomers are not monolithic, and among those diverse layers, here we are. I mean, the ethnicities, the minorities, the subsegments of the subcultures. Mm -hmm. And the Hispanics are very, uh, very much a part of that, although in this particular case, in the boomers case, we are not the biggest minority. And we, we are not, uh, I mean, the ours is a very uh, young, population pyramid, yes, both in the States and in other Latino countries. 
So talking about this young pyramid and this age stratification, mm -hmm. Sharon, I, I would love to ask you uh, both, as you described yourself as a first generation uh, Filipino, and so mm -hmm. bringing that dimension in, as well as this whole notion of a communication channel. Because we've talked about language, okay. So we, we know that the language has to be different, but then mm -hmm. we also have to communicate in a very di through different channels. I would love to hear your, your perspective on that. Um, well, our focus is on social media. So when we look at different generations, we know that the younger generations are driving a lot of the social activity that gets the big headlines, like Facebook and people are tweeting. But I also think that um, you know boomers are not far behind in their adoption curve. They're also joining the same social media platforms. Um, I love thinking about Steve Jobs as a reference point because he was a boomer. And because his vision of technology was really rooted in arts and humanities, and that it really became this really special thing because of that perspective. It wasn't just about the technology. You know, he learned calligraphy from a monk and used that to inform how he built the first Mac. And I think that's really amazing. Um, I think that if you're a brand or a marketer, um, yes, the boomer generation is not as social, um, but I think that there's a lot of opportunities for what they do use. So we do know that boom, we do know that boomers use email primarily followed by search. So Google is doing a lot of great work in this area. Um, if you've heard of Zmont, which is their zero moment of truth, um, this is connected to the idea that boomers really love researching stuff before they buy it. So those strategies work really well. Um, I do have one more thought on the area of kind of what boomers want to share about themselves online. What we've observed is that younger generations want to share personal thoughts and feelings, right? Um, but the boomers aren't going to do that. But I do think they share stuff when it's really important. So if you look at a network like patientslikeme.com, which is healthcare, you're actually sharing data about your um, biometric data, about any conditions you might have, very personal stuff, right? But when you know that your data is gonna be aggregated with other people who mm -hmm. might have the same condition, and they will help researchers come up with better cures for whatever condition you have, those are opportunities where they feel that their privacy is not being invaded. And that's a different kind of social network, a different kind of social sharing. We're just touching on some of the characteristics that distinguish boomers from other generations. And I would love for, for any one of you to weigh in on that whole notion of what are those characteristics? Because I think you know, that, that we for me, you know, when, when I could, my data could be at, as part of an aggregate, that would be a, a fascinating thing to Jim or talk yeah, about I that as well as some products. A lot of great, a lot of great uh, points made is coming, sort of coming on the heels of this. Um, one way to think about this, if you think about how the boomers have always been used to having a huge impact on things, a pig mm -hmm. through the python mm -hmm. metaphor that's been around for a long time. If you think about it, the, I think the boomers are people who sort of view themselves as involved in a cultural project. And that's a lifelong project, which is mm -hmm. about creating mm -hmm. the self. And so that changes over time. And the networks you talk to, the kinds of things you're interested in, are all things that change. And I think as a result of those two things, if you look at how they're approaching aiding, aging, they're going to be like, a, they're not going to fall into Tomosthenes' mistake. And he was the person from Greek mythology who asked for eternal life, but not for eternal youth. And, and so I think for boomers, what you're going to see is they want to not just live long, but they want to live well. So I think if you think about those things, that's what their cultural project is that they're trying to work on going forward. Yeah, so Steve, join in. <laughs> you know, if, if I can add something, youth is so important to this audience. Boomers don't think of themselves of any, about in terms of anything else more so than youth. There, there, there's the, the wag who said the definition of youth today is if you're young <coughs> younger than Mick Jagger, you're young. <laughs> and that's definitely how boomers think about themselves. Um, they have, uh, they really are kind of uh, a lens to look at what our culture is today because um, we are a culture, you know, we're coming into a presidential election and we've got red America and blue America and boomers were really there and making things happen when America sort of started dividing in that way. We had the hippie generation that said we're rebelling against a lot of what's going on uh, in this country. We want values that are less materialistic and so forth. We have different political views. And then there were other boomers who said, no, I'm more traditional. We still see that divide among boomers and we see that divide playing out um, in the rest of the country. So 
um, they really are kind of, in a lot of ways, a symbol for what we think of as Americanness today. Um, and uh, I think that makes them uh, a very vibrant force uh, in America now. Go ahead. If I can pick up on Steve, uh, let me hitchhike on the, on the uh, youth part of it. As a communicator, if you are programming towards boomers on age, you may miss the whole, the whole picture. And to your point, the average boomer, as we all know, let's say a 55-year-old boomer, it thinks itself or acts or behaves 10 to 15 years, depending on, depending on where, where you are in, in your life, younger. So if you're designing for a 55-year-old and you're designing for that age, you're going to miss it. You really need to be designing for somebody that is in a different uh, mindset. And the second one is that you know, boomers get accused of being uh, brand loyal. And you know, once they choose a brand, we're stuck. We're, we're there. And you will miss it again. Uh, boomers go for value. Do, they do attach themselves to emotional uh, connectors and, and relationships. But value is important. Make me look smart in order to do the we. So the shift that we're seeing is not just the me generation. It's me. It's we through me. <laughs> right, right. So it's that it's that pathway that we need to to keep in mind. And these myths have to be broken. And this panel is is smashing them. And the other myth. <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> the, other, the other myth, I think, is that there is, there's been these racial divides, and you've heard that through history, and yet if you look generationally, those, mm -hmm. the, I don't know if it's <coughs> mythology or, or if it's fact, that those uh, separations are being eliminated with, with the younger generation. Do you have anything, uh, Doug I or Malta, to, to add to that conversation? We are not close to elimination yet, but I think they, they have been attenuated to it big extent, this is millennials and, and the, the ones younger than them are, are being raised and came of age in a very diverse world as compared to the baby boomers world. However, in the case of Hispanics, Hispanic boomers, let's say, which is a sort of a weird thing to say. We never use that <laughs> denomination. Uh, but uh, Hispanic boomers, well, they have uh, suffered hyphenation uh, as much as African Americans, although it, is, it can be a good badge of honor. It was also in, in our case because of language, language issues, uh, job, kind of job issues, even immigration issues. It was uh, not a very strong sense of belonging sometimes. You have to have a, going back to double consciousness, is for younger people, for millennials, Hispanic millennials, which we like to call fusionistas because they are the experts in fusion. It is being, it's about being 100% American and 100% Hispanic. There's no conflict there and no problems with math either. But for the older ones, for the baby booming ones, it's been a very long road and a very hard one. And uh, we pretty much hope that inclusion includes us. Yes, I, um, I agree. I, I think that uh, I, had, I grew up in Hartford, Connecticut, the uh, inner city of Hartford. Then I went to a prep high school. So my junior high school, seventh and eighth grade, we had 1,300 kids. We had nine white students. I never seen them, but they said they were there somewhere. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but it was primarily an inner city school. Then my prep school had 858 black students. Then I went to Tufts University, Procter and Gamble. Then I went to the Army as an enlisted soldier. And so what I see is I see real common purpose and common values, but unfortunately different experiences. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? So when I was with my prep school buddies, the, I mean, very different levels of wealth, but we had different uh, common concepts of success. But what we were going through daily to get there was very different. So we were connected, but sometimes when I would explain the disconnect, they'd be like, I don't see that, Doug, you know? I said, no, you got to listen. I'll, I'll tell you all about it if you listen. So and I think this is not just in the ethnic place but on many elements of difference, we need to just understand there's a different experience people are having. And not wanting much more. We don't want special treatment. We just want access mm -hmm. and opportunity to the same things, but the experiences become different. 
Yeah. So then, so then, in in terms of marketing and, and advertising, how is it that you build, and also in terms of language, Emilio, how is it that you build in those differences, and and and, those, and what are your strategies to make sure that they're impactful? Well, I think in, you know, in marketing, especially think about products and how that sort of plays out in the store all the way through, is one of the things is that you know we don't want to confuse segmentation with segregation. So if you think about it, on one level you probably don't want to have those products classified as for aged people, <laughs> right? So, so I if you're going to want to track boomers or anyone, you're going to want to make sure that it has a, multi, a sort of a multi-age audience. So it might be more along the way of interest if you're trying to sort of target things. And I, we've seen the same thing to be true of other products. If you think about like, you know, if you're, you know, you're doing products that are targeted to African Americans or Hispanics, you want to be very careful that you're not you know, communicating something else is okay, separate, but equal inside the store, right? Which is right. always a kind of a problem. And we've also seen the same thing with products targeted to males. So, what we're starting to see is, you know, we need to come to a more, you know, almost multicultural approach to how we're going to do marketing in the first place. Mm -hmm. So, place all the way through, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Every <laughs> human being has multiple identities. <coughs> Nobody sees anything funny about being a son at the same time that you're a father, at the same time that you're uh, a husband. Uh, and uh, the same is true as we've been talking about with people's um, identities, whether it's cultural or ethnic. Uh, or whatever. And so representing different kinds of people in advertising is one approach, but getting deep and finding commonalities, finding human truths that really apply to everybody is really a powerful way to go. Um, I remember working for um, uh, some time on 7UP uh, International. Uh, we developed a, a, an advertising campaign that, was, uh, th that we developed by finding common ground among radically different cultures. We went to Argentina, we went to the Philippines, we went to London, we went to Saudi Arabia, and we found a cartoon character um, that, pardon? Fido. You remember. <laughs> Fido was unforgettable, right? He went to Argentina, he went to Trinidad. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, I think we had a problem because people liked our uh, poster so much that they were stealing them yeah, and they were right. flooding the switchboard we that, yeah. at Leo Burnett. Um, uh, asking for copies of the posters, we found something <laughs> about, about human nature that really rang true wherever you were. And that's really kind of the magic. If you can really speak to folks and everybody feels heard, then you've bridged the divide. So, Amelia, how does this, I was going to say, how does this turn into this new life cycle? And how do we sort of like bring that information forth so that it can inform how we Market sure. to, this, well, to these boomers. Take, take Stephen's uh, point of view here about uh, celebrating sort of the commonalities, but it's also celebrating the differences. Yes. Yes. And that's right. what we're seeing in the marketplace, and it's a challenge for marketeers uh, and for communicators. But there's, one, uh, there's an emerging uh, aspect that ties to <coughs> your social media that if you can add an ingredient to the communications process. So right now we have many companies dealing with social graph of your life, right? Mm -hmm. People like Facebook. Then you have interest graph uh, companies like um, uh, you know, skiing.com or Groupon that are putting both of those together. With boomers, if you can add the purpose graph mm. to that equation, now all of a sudden it's not about age, but it's closer to where you're talking about what is my experience. Yeah. Yeah. And boomers are looking for that meaning and purpose. Mm -hmm. Don't tell them you're going to help them find it because they're not going to like that, yeah. but it's there. And those companies and those advertising agencies that can bring the purpose graph and the meaning graph with your interest and your social, I think will find a new audience yeah. for, for the products and also for the communications yeah. process. And I would say that I, I understand what you're saying, but in the case of what you might call Fido, I don't know how we call it Fido Dido. <laughs> 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 in that case, it was a, a very interesting campaign that was based on things that were relevant in, in very different environments, but all of them were what we would now call general market in their respective countries. And that's a big difference. I mean, you can, you can fine tune, uh, but you still would be talking to one single audience in a way. Uh, in, in this country, I uh, believe we might agree that respecting the differences and mostly bringing up relevant experiences that make people. We are all in agreement that this is about the life stage of boomers in, in America, as it is about the life stage of senior citizens all over 
the Latin American countries than Spain, let's say. But here, uh, the minorities are not necessarily meaningfully addressed by a one size fits all. And I understand the complexity of, and we shouldn't go to the segregation, but we shouldn't go to the wash down either. Right. And, and what Go happens ahead. is Chuck, oh, what I would love to do is to ask you to sort of jump in on this, but also this whole notion, see, from a boomer's perspective, this whole notion of, of uh, speaking to a multicultural, multi-generational boomer. Well, in this conversation between you and me, yes. started with me touching you on the, on the arm. Right. You and I are having a conversation. Right. I was taught advertising by a man who said that if you want to talk to somebody, have a conversation with them. S look them in the eye, express your views, and most important, listen to what they have to say. And that's what makes great advertising. I quoted um, Franklin uh, earlier today, uh, who summed up this whole process in one word, R-E-S-P-C-T. <laughs> and that's really what that this is all Aretha's about. Word. <laughs> that wasn't Ben, it was Aretha. <laughs> and that's, <laughs> that's what this conversation is all about. If you show respect, first of all, you're going to open that channel of communication. We're going to have a conversation, and that conversation can be had with anyone. Mm -hmm. Everybody has to be treated like an individual and spoken to with respect like another human being. It's tough because we're all tribal. We come from evolution, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. We have to evolve past our wired self, our DNA. And that's what's going to make us able right. to respect one another as opposed to, well, you have an accent, so you must be different than I am and not quite as good. That has to disappear. I, th I think that's a, that's a key distinction, which is difference does not mean good, better, or worse. I mean, and so the difference is just difference. But I want to go right. back to Sharon because, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. Jump in real quick good, because, Doug. Uh, I love what was brought up by Stephen around commonality. And one of the things for people who have been historically excluded, the road to commonality is valuing differences. Mm -hmm. So the road to commonality doesn't come Absolutely. from finding commonality. It's, it comes from understanding my uniqueness. Mm -hmm. Then I'm like, you're my God. That's, you see what I'm saying? So, it, so, so we right. look for this point of connection versus appreciating the points of disconnection. And uh, in advertising, it, it's an interesting dynamic because the other thing that takes place is that the research around advertising is extremely diverse. But then sometimes it comes into a pocket where the people who are making a decision around it is not. <laughs> so all this great info, and then you get everybody in the room, and it's like they still come out with something that's missing the mark. <laughs> so you got to have it inside right. as you get this information outside and then bring those two together and you have beautiful marketing. Quick story, my wife and I are driving down this, the road and there's a, a, a Nike poster and it's a boy playing basketball against a little girl. So I look at the poster, I'm like, oh, nice poster. My wife says, wow. I said, what, man? That's a boy playing against a girl. I never seen a boy playing against a girl. Mm -hmm. Now for me, it's just another poster, <laughs> right? Yeah, How right. many things we see is just another poster while somebody else is going, wow. Mm -hmm. Right. You see what I'm saying? And we need to find the wow, because I like the poster, but I didn't like it like my wife. I had to buy nine pair of Nikes after that. You know what I'm saying? So <laughs> the reality is that there's different points of connection that if you need to diversify this thing, and, and that difference becomes the way of bringing that commonality together. And Doug, yeah. don't we have the tools today to bring people something customized for them the way we never could before. It's right. a yes, long so. tail yeah, society. Yeah. You don't have to do yeah. one commercial for everybody. You can have so many different pieces of communication. And Chuck, you said a conversation. Well now, we could literally have a conversation. Yes. In the old days, we used to talk about advertise as if you're having a personal conversation. Now we can literally talk back and forth real time with our consumers. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. I, I would try to jump in on this because the social media phenomena, everybody keeps thinking that it is really a younger generation and we know the how uh, boomers are over-indexing um, in it as a form. So I would just love to, to have you t talk a little bit more about that and the distinction right? and its usage you know, um, in, the, in the groups. They completely are jumping. Um, we had a really interesting experience at our agency just last month um, that will illustrate this. It was around um, the Trayvon Martin 
killing, which was the young 17-year-old boy in Florida who was unarmed and shot, et cetera. So when, when the shooter was not prosecuted, um, we actually held an event in New York at Union Square. And what we did was we created a Facebook event and a website to just ask people to wear a hoodie. He was wearing a hoodie at the time of his death which made him look suspicious. So we said, let's get some people to speak out against racial profiling, mm -hmm. upload a picture of yourself wearing a hoodie, post it to the internet, um, Twitter, Facebook, whatever. We didn't quite know what to expect, but what happened next was we started getting photos from people young, old, people from all across the US, people from around the world. Um, a lot of them were mothers, a lot of them were grandmothers posing in hoodies with their children. Um, it was just an amazing experience to see how social media now provides a wider spectrum of engagement, I think, for more people to show support for a cause or to kind of break down these barriers that we were talking about before. And when I mean spectrum of engagement, I, I mean that we had an online component where it's very easy for people to do it. Some people are not happy that it's so easy to do it. But we also had this offline component where if you felt really strongly, you could come to Union Square in New York in person. And again, we saw people of all ages, and it really surprised us because we thought that th the only people might be younger people. Um, but I think social media is starting, we're just seeing the beginning of this unpredictability of who's gonna get engaged to a message that resonates across generations. There, there's an interesting thing that you just said there, Sharon, and anyone can weigh in on this, is that this, this whole notion, and it goes back to your conversation about touching, that people are looking, for, you know, because everybody's saying that social media will make you more isolated and have you disengage and not have the personal connection. But you talked about this opportunity to create both that in-person kind of gathering and opportunity, but at the same time, this online. And so that is a new phenomena for, for us in this world, and it's also a new phenomena for, for boomers. And so it'd be interesting to see how that is going to affect how we communicate and how we present products and, and services. Emilio. Well, I, just to piggyback on a few of the comments here, don't be afraid of doing a multi-generational approach in your communications mm -hmm. and feel like you're going to alienate the boomer population. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Mm -hmm. uh, we've never seen the, the connection so strong between the boomer population, for instance, and the millennials, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, which is right. enormous. Mm -hmm. But I think social media, to Stephen's point, it opens up an entire way of coming of age into the boomer conversation, which is peer-to-peer. You know, boomers don't trust a lot of people other than the peer-to-peer, -peer, <laughs> right? But in many ways, mm -hmm. that peer-to-peer check-in is valuable to whatever brand you're trying to, to peddle into the marketplace. Because they're going to check in with their peers now in ways that we have never seen before, mm -hmm. before they make that purchase decision. Yeah. Which is part of the DNA unraveling of their brand loyal to a point. But that peer-to-peer -peer that we're talking about is huge. Don't be afraid of making it intergenerational. The other thing you, you run into is that people will get turned off by the medium if they experience something negative in the medium. So I've talked to boomers and they say, did you hit, did this person said this on Facebook? I'll never use Facebook again. <laughs> like, hold it, hold it. That was just a bad person saying a bad thing. But they'll turn the whole medium off because it's not about the medium for baby boomers. It's about the message. Yes, yes. You see what I'm saying? So the message can go through any medium, but when it's negative, yes. You know, I know my wife was, well, I, let me stop talking about my wife, but she just, you know, <laughs> cut it down. I don't want it. You know, they'll turn the whole process off. And I'll be like, well, you can do this with it. You can do that with it. Mm -hmm. But they see these bad examples. So the element of quality, mm -hmm. no matter what the medium is, I think is a foundation for how we see the world. And we're open mm -hmm. to yeah. different mediums if it's connected with the quality component. But, yeah. but, can I, but, but why then do most advertisers still ignore the 49 plus or the 40 plus exactly. you know, uh, in the marketplace. What's yeah. going on? Because yeah. advertisers Jumping created the youth yeah. generation. Yeah. The yeah. Advertisers, and guilty, <laughs> I, was, I was there. Yeah. Advertisers uh, established this level of obsession that boomers have with young people because boomers are young people. It was easy, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> so now, after being indoctrinated, after being part of a society that changed things dramatically, the 60s were pretty exciting, I would have to say, and frightening, and all of the other stuff that went together. Now they're hitting, six, the first of them hit 65 this year. Right. How do you take somebody who's been told that young is the only thing to be all their lives, yeah. and now say to them, you're not that young anymore. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So you have people who deny the reality, a friend of mine who will not take a senior ticket at the movies, mm -hmm. will not buy, will buy an adult ticket because she says, I don't want to watch that freaking movie depressed. <laughs> That's what we have to change. This whole yeah. this whole idea of the of the hoodie, yes, yeah, the, the language, language and the whole critical. idea of taking these Absolutely. these uh, these symbols, these terms, and exposing them to the to the marketplace in the world, and saying that does not work, mm -hmm. that does not work anymore. Here's a grandmother in a hoodie. What are you going to do? You're going to arrest her? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the more we do all of this, you know, Jim and I are wearing our hoodies. You know. <laughs> We got gray hair. <laughs> <laughs> we all have our hoodies, Doug so we have to we have to uh, take the edge, the meanness, yeah. and and the discriminatory side of these things off these terms. Yeah. Yeah. I think that social media is going to play a huge role. To your point, as marketers start to discover this, I think sort of the first uh, discovery of this is at least in a, you know, from research I've done it, as well as personal experiences is if you think about it, connecting with your children whether in college, which is impossible to connect with them on the phone or with email, right, leaves you with things like text and, and, and Twitter and Facebook. What has started to happen is you think about that sort of your initial toe in the water and what's happened as a result of that is you're starting to see, and I think we'll continue to see, that social media is going to be a way in which boomers are going to explore what their options are as they go forward into the future. Mm -hmm. So I think as you start to see it, to your point earlier, Milo, I think you know, it's, it's an emerging media for boomers because they haven't quite gotten comfortable with all the things yet. And we still ask a lot of questions like, you know, what, what does this do again? Right? <laughs> but I think as people start to understand what the potential of it is, it's going to be a, a very important tool. And I think it'll be an important tool for marketers because it allows you to listen, which you were both saying earlier, as to a conversation yeah. and hear what consumers are saying. So I think in that sense, it helps you get back to all those things you're talking about in a conversation about being able to communicate with boomers in the way they want to be communicated. Yes. Mm -hmm. What's okay. amazing yeah. to me is that I, I find this, so we have two boomer generations, right, in my home. I live, my mother lives with me. And she's taught me how to Skype, right, because she had the time <laughs> to learn it, and I don't. But, but it is interesting how she has become a lot more adaptable yes. to yeah. some of these medium the yeah. channels than, yeah. than I have. But it is the way that we do communicate with this extended family that now lives. And that is critical for our market, for, for Hispanics all over the planet. Because and, and the, the essential purpose of uh, the social media is to stay in touch with those that you really live far away, either within this country or somewhere else. It is more about convenience and the ability not to feel isolated and uh, not to feel not in contact with those we, we love or want to know about. But uh, in our culture, it, it is also very, very important to feel the presence of uh, the offline yeah. relations yeah. and the network. I mean, uh, we are social networkers. Hispanics are very promiscuous people who have always been very <laughs> <laughs> with, without the thing. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think she meant it in a very no, no, no. sense. No, no, uh, no. In terms of Hispanics. Boys um, will be boys. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> or girls. Um, <laughs> and so anyway, what I would love to, do, I mean, because I do think, but I think there is this concern, all right? There is yeah. this whole concern using these new mediums in terms right. of privacy, Sharon. I mean, yes. you, you alluded to it before. The concern that we have is that uh, how much do we, you reveal and then how much are you protecting? And so yeah. it'll be interesting to, to h hear your perspective on that. Oh. And then I'm going to ask you one more question. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, like I said before, I think the generations just have different um, things that they consider are private. Mm -hmm. So for younger generations to live stream my entire life <laughs> to everyone with my personal life and details, um, mixing my personal and professional life may not be such a big deal. Um, but again, we have all types of data, like again, medical data, personal data, emotional data. Um, and I think in the end, it's really about the value exchange. Mm -hmm. um, younger generations now will give all my uh, email addresses, contact information for a coupon, right? Yeah. Or a discount, because uh, that's my value exchange. Um, I think brands need to come up with more compelling value exchanges if they want the data. Like they have to create the story about, if we learn more about you, we won't stop. We will stop spamming you with really bad ads, and you'll get kind of the valuable products that you've been looking for. And right. I think that's kind of the ideal we're all trying to look towards. Um, I think that 
we hear a lot about you know, boomers saying they're not being marketed to. I, I really think institutions like the AARP actually has to educate us, the agencies and brands mm -hmm. who market on how we can better reach you. If, you. if you listen to the way marketers today like to talk about brand, it's about utility, right? It's about apps, it's about um, things that boomers actually do value. I just feel like there's a point there, but I feel like you have to educate us mm -hmm. and say all these brand utility is actually making your life better. It's giving you the better price on things that you actually want and not bothering you with kind of ads that you don't. It's that personalization. Well, well and then, yeah. and then, th then okay. you guys have to stop marketing to us uh, by age yeah. and classifying us yeah. by age. You know, you walk into a room, it's not, oh, there's Emilio, he's 50 years old. Yeah. You know, it, it's a personality issue that also, and, and it's a long-term process, but you can't ignore the market. The market, if you ignore that market as any marketeer or any brand, is that your own peril? Yeah, well, uh, absolutely. There's a natural force that's mm -hmm. going to be a gravitational pull drawing marketing toward boomers, and it's really two little things. Mm -hmm. And those are the two trillion dollars <laughs> plus. Yes. <laughs> that yeah. Plus boomers. Yes. That, 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 that boomers spend. And the fact is, boomers are, in a lot of ways, the easiest generation mm -hmm. to reach because yeah. boomers still so read true. newspapers, so true. Yeah. still mm -hmm. listen to the radio, Love TV. television. <laughs> um, uh, it's really a rainbow mm -hmm. of media that uh, boomers consume, and certainly they use social media differently, not as much, uh, use them in a different way, but that's Utilitarian. evolving. No. Utilitarian. Get in, get out, I know what I want. Well, yeah. You know, well, but, but purpose, purpose, purpose also purpose. kicks in, too. Well, I know what yeah, I, I want once I search huge. for huge. it and, once research, I, and, I, and, and I get my it. peers' opinion on it. So it's yeah. not so much I know what I want. It's sort of I know what I yeah. want, mm -hmm. and then I'll know what I want. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. And it, it's very research-based. We conducted very recently qualitative interviews with uh, Carbine Intenders, uh, Hispanics, uh, mostly Spanish dominant from all over the country. And they would research in the myriad uh, sites that could provide information about a comparison between cars, as long as, or up to the moment, when they were asked for personal information. And these were not only mm -hmm. uh, boomers. These were, there were a lot of 30-somethings mm -hmm. over there. Mm -hmm. It is a cultural thing, I don't know. It's just something to take into account. U utilitarian mm -hmm. uh, has its limits when it sometimes it collides with some cultural aspects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The other thought that's, that's coming to mind, I was reading something around, and it's going back to the point of purpose about how boomers who had kids in the uh, war, mm -hmm. like about 95% of them learned how to use Skype. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. None of them knew anything about Skype, but it was a way to see their kid at war. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's like purpose over the vehicle. So you know, people come here, let's Skype. Skype for what? What am I <laughs> Skyping for? You're right here, I can see you. <laughs> right, but when they go to war, so now I got a purpose to use mm -hmm. technology. So I think when we come, the boomers, we come with the vehicle. And the vehicle isn't exciting. Yeah, right. I ain't gonna tweet what? Yeah. What am I gonna tweet? You know, <laughs> but give me a purpose. Mm -hmm. I'll tweet all day. And I think that the reason why they miss our market is they don't come purpose first, they come vehicle first. Mm -hmm. Very well said. And I think many times that yes. helps or hinders, yes. I should say, the success in connecting to us. Well, I think yeah, that's absolutely. also related to the point earlier making about private information. Uh, there are two reasons why boomers are suspicious of that. One, of course, is the big brother that. thing that sort of went all the way yeah. through a lot of their lives. But I think a second one is they're saying, if I give you this information, what am I getting for it? And what they've seen in so many cases, if you look at how most of the old loyalty programs were built in the 90s, you're saying, it's not worth it. Juice isn't worth the squeeze in terms of what I get out of it. <laughs> so I think you know what we're seeing is that entire, you know, until they start to get there through some of this iterative stuff and the social media you know, leveraging it, I think you know uh, they'll happily start to exchange it there, but the value has to be seen. Mm -hmm. yeah, no doubt. Right. No doubt. And it goes back to your purpose point. Yeah, that's right. right. That's right. the thing. Yes, you have the right purpose. The message is the message. Mm -hmm. Yes. I would. I would love. You know, you. You. I'm going to go back to you always, like Chuck, as the elder statesman, all right? And, <laughs> and for you, because I think there's been a lot of discussion on privacy. And I think you know we talked about it from a value perspective. We talked about it, uh, you know, whether it's purpose that's going to drive it, and what what are you go, how much of your privacy are you going to give up? But is there a concern? Is there a distinction within the boomer population in terms of 
how much of that privacy and the fear of how that information is going to be used? Is, is there a distinction between the boomers and, and let's say some other younger cohorts? Um, it kind of rides on the latest hacker news. Uh, millennials, uh, boomers, everybody in between. Here's a, a, a piece on, on the network news, reads a piece in the paper about some kid in Russia who's figured out a ha how to hack into the de de Defense Department. If you can get into the, the uh, Defense Department's mainframes, you can get into the cloud. So when you start thinking about that, and I've been involved in technology for 30 years. Uh, I had the first Mac, the very first one, with the signatures on the inside of the case. And um, that's what passes through my mind and passes through people a lot younger than I am uh, in terms of, of the safety of information. And, and the, the other interesting thing is um, one of the things that a person my age uh, reacts to is seeing four young people sitting around a table at a restaurant texting. One of the things <laughs> that Marta talked about was the fact that uh, d Latinos communicate. They're big with communicating and talking to one another. If you're doing this all the time, you're losing your social skills. You're not gaining them. You're usually using a social mechanism, but you're losing your social skills. And that's something that, that, uh, that somebody my age looks at very carefully. So I think this is all going to kind of uh, evolve and roll. All of your personal life is not mixed with your business life because now you have to censor it. Because employers are looking at you on Facebook saying, yes. well, what, what's she up to? Yes. And that's not comfortable. That's not comfortable. Nobody's yeah. comfortable with that. No. So, think, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Go the ahead. other powerful thing, Chuck, is, is the word friends <laughs> mm. <laughs> for baby boomers versus <laughs> others. So, I mean, their goal is to get as many friends as they can. Right. Yeah. And my, you know, my father, like, you got two good friends, right. you're in good shape. <laughs> right. You know, all you need is two. Hang on to them. <laughs> <laughs> right. Hang on to them. And the word friends is being used, and, and even how they define friends mm -hmm. differently from maybe how a boomer defined friends, yeah, and that absolutely. social connection yes, exactly. is different. So LinkedIn, for example, it's like, I, like, I love LinkedIn. I'm not a Facebook guy. Mm -hmm. But I'll link, I'll link in. That just feels better. I'll link into a million people. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but you just to say, do yeah. you friend me? I'm like, well, who is this guy? Where yeah. do I know him from? No. So, but I don't feel that with LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. The person could be just as unknown. You see what I'm saying? But mm -hmm. on LinkedIn, it's easier to just say, okay, no problem. He might be a good person to know. So I think that word friend and how we look at it versus mm -hmm. how other look, looks. And I, mean, I talk to my children. It's, we've had some dynamic discussions around the word, you know, just what it means and how I see it. And it's no right or wrong, but it's, very distinct. It's like this is somebody I know. Okay, yes. we'll call them that. And you know, they're my friend. I'm like, okay. Well, that's, yeah, that's I, your I way. Mean, you've got to weigh in on this language conversation <laughs> because it's just, it really is at the core. And Steve, please do also, because I think it is at the core of the distinction between the millennials and the boomers. Um, well, I mean, forget about the Gen Xers, that's another generation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. as, as a panel here, these are the experts in creating language into imagery, but you know, it's also behavior. I think you were talking about, uh, and, and Chuck, the boomers are getting on the technology efficiency because they want to be effective. They want to accomplish things versus perhaps others that are looking more from an entertainment perspective or, you know, a, a social. But language matters in not just in the purchasing behavior, but in connecting with the heart as mm -hmm. well as the wallet. And the boomers have been marketed to since uh, Mr. Potato Head and the Slinky, which were the first, you know, kick on you know, for mass marketing. If we are experts at finding out whether you are trying to sell me something, meaning the boomers, or not, we, we know how to sift through media. Mm -hmm. I think social media can be a humongous connector and, and a leveler of language with the boomers. Mm -hmm. If you do it from a point of view of efficiency, accomplishment, happiness, and help me make things better for not just myself, but for my family. So family. You know, it, it's all about language. Uh, by the way, b boomers don't like experts. They want to have a coach or a mentor, yes. mm -hmm. right? Yes. Uh, the, the concept of language has now been transformed by not just this generation, but the Gen Xers mm -hmm. coming right behind us. And, and we'll miss it. I mean, old senior retired are not very popular words. The big word, retirement. How many definitions of retirement uh. we have today? And there's you know, no if I wasn't good surfing, word right, if I wasn't surfing at 30, why would I want to <laughs> surf at 50 and see myself in a, in a television? That's not relevant to me. Uh -huh. So 50 is the new 50. 
Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and we were, I was accused of the 50 is the new 30, so I apologize about that. But, but 50 is the new 50. And that kind of language, I'm not done yet, mm -hmm. uh, is, is, is critical phrases that boomers will resonate with you, but they know when there's a gimmick coming. So we've got to be very careful with the medium as well, not just the message. Well, that's yeah. absolutely true, Emilio. And boomers tend to see a gimmick when you talk to them about a smartphone. Um, boomers are far <laughs> less likely to use a smartphone. I work on um, the Sprint uh, wireless account, mm. so I know a little bit about this. Interesting. And um, I I we've been talking about how uh, boomers use social media differently. Well, um, getting on Facebook has changed for younger people because you have your smartphone with you all over the place and you yeah. can connect with people anytime via social media. And boomers are much more likely to say, smartphone to connect to the internet all the time. I don't see it. And people think, well, it's not going to happen. Well, the United States used to use very little in the way of text messaging. Europe was ahead. And we said, well, I guess it's just not a thing for the United States. Well, it came later because people discovered mm -hmm. it. We didn't have as much economic pressure to use it because pricing over there in Europe made it much more advantageous to use text messaging. So they got it first. But we figured it out. Boomers are going to figure out the value of having the smartphone, and a lot of the behaviors will be pulled along then because it's with you all the time and you can use it. And uh, we have to remember the mutual influence that always existed and exists between boomers and millennials and the uh, echo boomer original uh, denomination by uh, Yankelovich. I mean, we are mutually uh, learning from each other or coaching each other. Mm -hmm. So our children will uh, teach us how to do the thing of passing to uh, mobile or smartphones as a way, a, a privileged way of accessing the internet. And that's, and the we will that's the consistent, uh, uh, with, with us as human beings, yes. we have for a thousand generations taught the younger how to do things so when they get a little bit older, they're going to teach the younger and it passes up through and that's why we, thanks to our posing thumb, been able to develop the brain that we have yes, now. Absolutely. You know, that's a very powerful thing. Uh, if you right. if, if you extract what you're talking about, uh, adaptation. In the boomer, we have, the boomers have had to adapt to a gazillion changes mm -hmm. and now more than ever. Mm -hmm. yes. So yeah. now all of the, the systems that we all grew up with, are we can't trust them, uh, or at least boomers can't trust them. And what, are, what is that, that navigational system that allows us to live our life in the best way we can? Adaptation in a changing world is a very powerful frame to introduce a service, mm -hmm. a market, or, or a product. And I go back to help me live my best life, help me adapt, then I'll, I'll, I'll opt in. The concept of, of recruiting me for something is gone with boomers. They're opting in, let me have the choice. And I do agree, Stephen, on the, uh, on the concept of, of, um, of the early and later adopters, but let's face it, boomers w are buying more smart uh, devices than anybody else in the marketplace. I mean, look at the sales of iPads and iPhones. 75% are 50 plus. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe they're buying it for somebody else in the, in the, <laughs> in the household and themselves. But ignoring that wave will ignore your bottom line mm -hmm. in, in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Apple doesn't advertise to seniors. Right. No. I mean, most of that insight comes from our children sometimes. Yes, absolutely. You know, getting the iPad, like, I don't need that. Oh, yeah, here's what you can do. You can put all your bills on here. You go, oh, really, really? You can do all that? Next mm -hmm. thing you know, you're going out. So it's a new positioning, same product, new positioning. Yeah. You see what I'm mm -hmm. saying? And that new positioning, it's like it's, that's that connection you were talking about earlier. This thing is good. <laughs> now, why it might be good for you, it would be a little bit different why it's good for you, but it's a good thing, and we reposition. So Martha, both Martha and, and, and uh, Chuck both talked about this changing role, you know, like, when you were once an influencer, and now you're the one that's being influenced in this intergenerational aspect. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to be a, an important discussion because as we, it's also going to be important because we're going to have a panel after this panel that's going to be a youth panel reacting to everything that you said. So this is your time to be an influencer uh, and to also help uh, shape that conversation. But it, it, is, it is interesting, uh, Jim, when you start thinking about those distinct roles and that and how those are evolving. Um, how is it that, you know, as a, as a marketeer, and, you know, without being gimmicky, all right, knowing that who you are doing this for, how is it that you address that? Because it is about positioning the product yes. in a very yes. different way. Mm 
Well, I mean, I think one of the biggest things we said is something that, that Doug mentioned earlier, which was about it's now purpose over product feature is what we're seeing increasingly. And we've done a lot of work with neuroscience and eye tracking and all those kinds of things to see how people process things. And you realize that all these things happen in a fraction of a section, second. And so what we've seen is that you have the rise of visual literacy. I can, you know, I can do all this stuff without ever uttering more than six or seven words. And I think if I can get to the heart of the matter, which is the benefit of the purpose, which is exactly what you described with your you know, iPad example, that's a really good way to communicate with anyone, right? So that what's beautiful about that is, again, if you look at boomers, they're much more focused on the purpose or benefit of this product. So I think it becomes a way to sort of go after that without ever having to, to say, oh, we're going after a specific age group, or it's not so much focused on who yeah. is in, the, right. who you're picturing the in the commercial. And, yeah. and about not alienating any of both generational ends, because if you, if you believe that by focusing on millennials, you will be cooler, you might be wrong. I mean, the one of the other thoughts coming to mind as you're talking about it, even purpose with them. I know they had that uh, that body wash for the young people where you, you use it. You eight girls come running. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I go in the bathroom. My son got like eight bottles. Yeah. I'm like, what's, what's going on? You know, the purpose was <laughs> was impressive. Yeah. So purpose, purpose is also for others. You know, it's like it was body wash, maybe body wash, but that ad did was great. Yes. based on the purpose that it put out there. And so that, and then you look at that multiculturally. You know, how does that work around purpose multiculturally? You know, what, how do you get the right information to say, this is what would give that purpose for me. This is what would give that. And then have people assessing that through diverse eyes, I think we're on to something. Well, you know, one, one thing, just to follow up on your example um, about the body washes, what's interesting about that is the people who consume it are not the people who buy it. The people who are buying that product are mothers of those young adolescents right. or young adults, right? And we're pretty sure that their mothers don't think that if they use this, they're going to get lucky. <laughs> what they're saying is, I'm just so grateful that they're taking an interest in their personal hygiene, right? So if you think about <laughs> how, you're tr how you're trying to get to the purpose, right? And say, again, you got different segments. So I think that's one of the ways we can sort of you know, address some of this messaging wise. Right, you've never been cleaner, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but I, I before <laughs> before we move on to it to a sort of like a different area, I would really like uh, Chuck to talk a little bit more because it, it really that you made an interesting comment before when you using the medium and saying you know you you do lose these like social abilities and and what is it that we can you know sort of like impart particularly because it is such a phenomena and it is such an influencer and an intergenerational aspect. You know, this use of the four people at the dinner table not talking to each yeah. other, but obviously connecting with someone else and not using that opportunity. Maybe it won't consume. <laughs> yeah, you can't, you can't yeah. Happen, yeah. Well, yeah, I think it's the, the value of storytelling, which in our business has always been, sometimes it slipped into the background. The technology's forced it into the background because the tech doesn't have a story. It has a bing and a bang and a boom. So uh, I think if you focus on the value of storytelling, again, I hate, hate to keep going back to 10,000 years ago when our campfires, but, but we were telling each other stories. And that's how we uh, shared information as cultures and, and as people, and it's how we evolved. So we have to, I think, reappreciate. Some never lost it. We, we have to reappreciate the value of the story. I think I think this is an interesting. Go ahead, Emilio. Were you going to say something? No, I I think storytelling is a huge antidote for yeah. what we're talking about here, and we we believe, and it's across all generations. Yes, maybe coming from different different yeah. points of view, mm -hmm. and and I think that's the responsibility. There's a certain sense of responsibility and purpose and meaning from the generation of telling their story, yeah. mm -hmm. and frankly, that they're not done telling the story right. yet and, or shaping it. So we have a few more years to go to finish mm -hmm. that storytelling. It's very powerful conversation to have if you have a product that or a service that can connect to that. Beautiful. Yeah, there's storytelling and, and there's listening skills. I yeah. think that's something the boomers have yeah. to impart yeah. to the millennials. Sherry, Sherry Turkle, the psychologist at MIT, spends a lot of time right. studying and writing about the relationship that we have with our technology. And she's observed that we put ourselves in a bubble when we forget basic manners. We're talking with somebody, we don't really engage in that conversation because we're looking at a device, we allow ourselves to be interrupted, we say, well, I'm talking to you, but there's something else that's more important, and it interrupts the flow of 
the conversation. It interrupts the story. It interrupts the experience of, of listening. And I think that is something that um, we, we can value as, as boomers and that we can impart to, to anyone else. Mm -hmm. the, the other thing, Laurie, too, that I'm, I'm curious why it hasn't come up in the panel yet is the optimistic point of view of the boomer generation as it relates to that they can do better despite the reckoning or the re Great Recession, whichever way you want to call it. And you know, in that Great Recession, that really um, tested the generation, especially the younger boomers. But you still saw huge optimism. And it's not about money. It's about what can I, I'm not done yet, and I know I can do better. Mm -hmm. and, and, it's, and it's interesting because I think that patina of optimism will define the generation. Uh, to come. So as advertisers and, and communicators, if you, <laughs> you miss that and go towards the aging, not the living, yeah. then you're missing the market. You're yeah. not going to the optimism of, you know, I can still right. do this, even if you have a chronic condition. Yeah. Well, Emilio, yeah, that yeah, goes yeah. back to the, the, um, the ambition of this generation. The, uh, ambition is really something that characterizes boomers. Yeah. Um, and back in the 60s, some of us remember, we knew we could change the world. Yes. If you yeah. can change the world, and did. And did. And did. But boomers are still thinking they can, and yeah. we are still right. changing the world. I mean, and that's the the, right. and the, 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 the worst an the worst analogy, uh, the, the Python yeah. uh, uh, analogy is is interesting. Uh, I heard it described by a, a sort of a seniors expert on uh, on NBC, who was saying the boomers are a bubble passing through a Python, and I listened to that and I said, what happens at the other end? <laughs> <laughs> it's a sk it, it's not a good kind of a picture to, to draw in, in somebody's mind, but, but the fact of the matter is that this whatever, however you want to describe it, is going to change society. As boomers become older and begin to appreciate the fact and understand the fact that they are older and that maybe they haven't treated older people all yeah. as well as they could have in their lives, our society, I think, is going to change because of that. Yes, it is. It is already. Yeah. And, and this society is going to get a little bit closer to the Asian societies, the Latino culture, where, where seniors, seniors are seniors. not only respected, but in many cultures, they're revered yeah. for what they know. Yeah. Yeah. I don't mean to run on here, but um, the tsunami, there was an island out there in Indonesia. And older folks saw the ocean going that way. And they said, we're out of here. All of us are out of here. And everybody's standing around going, what? And as a result, eight or ten people died on this island as opposed to thousands that could have died because the old folks knew yeah. what that meant. Yeah. Right. So which brings us to an interesting phenomenon. This is the first time in society, other than when we were an agricultural society, where we have three generations, yeah. you know, in, this, in the workplace. Yeah. And, yeah. and yeah. work yeah. probably yeah. four, yeah. probably yeah. four yeah. now, yeah. right. Uh, working towards a particular task and also going back to this whole notion of the role of the boomer as sort of like this elder statesman and the sage. It'll be interesting to see how that will change the workplace or the impact that that has on the workplace. I'd be, I'd be curious to see from any of your perspectives what you, what you view on that and, and, and also from a multicultural perspective. Yeah, no we, there's a term we use called generation of synergy which talks about there's a mindset from some that once they get older, they'll be like me, you know? But they've grown up in different times and different exposure. They'll never really be like us mm -hmm. because they've seen different things. We had two or three channels, and they all went off at 9 o'clock. You know, they got 8 million channels. They're just <laughs> exposed to so much that they got a different way of seeing the world. So how do you look at the word? And I think you brought up earlier, Chuck, is respect. Mm -hmm. And so we'll use the word respect, but then we say respect looks like this. And that's the air. The word is important, but the word has many different looks. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? So my father, I tell him, I, I once asked my father, why? Why should I do something? He said, I'm going to give you one answer. This will last the rest of your life, because I told you so. <laughs> 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 you know, I never used the word why again. Today we're conversing. Hi, son. Oh, hi. You know, we're having these long dialogues about cleaning the room. You know, th those things didn't really take place too much when we were growing up. So it's still respect. But it looks different. Mm -hmm. And so I think that is something we have to wrestle with. Because in the workplace, you know, even how we looked at managers and bosses was different. Mm -hmm. You know, how 
we, we, we believe that we had a term called pay your dues. Yes. Those, th you know, it's just a different yes. world yes. today and we fight it, yes. but it's just a reality. Yes, yes. And how do we bring all those differences together to produce outcomes is a task many organizations are addressing. But you know, there's also the concept though, the, the average 50 year old today is looking at 20 to 25 years of work ahead of them. Less, right. You know, to Lorraine's point about the mixture in the workplace, that is going to redefine yes. what it means to not only work, but to your point earlier, when that, at the end of that other Python, we don't know. We've never been here before in America where we have 70 year olds into retirement in the millions and millions and millions of generations. Yes. We've never really experienced that before, so we're entering a new territory. Right. And, and that is the responsibility, I think, of this. I love the synergy that you're talking about with the generations. Yes. There's a burden going on that it's not just for the millennials picking up the boomer, it's the other way around as well. No we have that responsibility. And it's a yeah, new, but it's a new trend. Well, so, sorry. No, that we, we shouldn't forget the f that when Xers came into the labor force, it was easy because there were so many boomers and so little exers. Now, we are facing another unparalleled situation. Yeah. Two generations with the same weight in terms of quantity and the same kind of energy as well. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so well, what's going to happen? Because the pay, pay your dues thing is not playing up. We both need each other. Uh, but it's also, I wouldn't say a power struggle, but where are you going to leave my place, place vacant? The exes do not believe in pay your dues. They, right. they, <laughs> they've, come, they've come from a generation yeah. where they've seen what pay, right. the results of paying your dues. Right. Yeah, so right. they've, seen, they've been the disappointed. They've seen all the disappointments of the mm -hmm. parents. And, and, um, Another and that real quick point. A trend in generations is that people are getting to maybe 60, 65, staying 15 more years. But I know an individual who was a CFO who's now a financial analyst. Yes, you that's what I'm He ran all the finance. He said, I want to continue working, but I don't want this kind of pressure. That's it. That's mm. it. So he kept working, right. but now he's a mentor. Mm -hmm. he's, in a, he's in a second level, entry level position hmm. when he was the top CFO. So when people stay, they either leave and do something they enjoy, right. or they'll go into another place where I'm like, I don't want the CFO thing anymore. I don't want that <laughs> level of pressure. And, and that's what we're seeing in the that's marketplace exactly. as that new life stage. Yeah, we talked right. about here right. earlier, and it's uh, undefined yet, right? Mm -hmm. It's on, it's unnamed yet, uh, but it also taps the purpose again. Yes, because that assume the fifty-two-year-old that just lost their job as a machinist, that job will never come back. Mm -hmm. But yes. they have to go to work, they have to go mm -hmm. work. and they have to reimagine their gifts, their passions, their values to find work. Yes. So therein lies another shift in language, right? I mean, boomers especially in the Gen Xers coming back, they're, they're having to reimagine, not reinvent. That's another word that is too big for, for yeah. a boomer. Yeah. That's right. too big, it's too heavy. Yeah. But reimagining means I have to go inside and figure this out. Yeah. That conversation is going to be very interesting for marketeers to tap into. Yeah. Because Google has it, LinkedIn's already onto it, and, and social media is leading the pack. Yes, Chuck. Yeah, the interesting thing is, uh, just from my perspective, I never heard the term road trip before the 60s. <laughs> Remember the road trip? <laughs> hey, where? Doesn't matter. <laughs> and you're on the road, and sometimes you're on the road for days, right. yes. you know? And, and I think that when you come from that kind of a, uh, an environment and a mindset, it, it's, it really it equips you especially to say, okay, I'm not going to do this anymore. <coughs> I'm going to take a new road. And so you have that flexibility built into you. My parents didn't have that. Mm -hmm. They couldn't do that. Right. And, and it, there's a lot of pain loose out there in our society now because people can't find the new road but it's there yeah. it's there we grow and, up and with it. are looking for it yep. yes, yes. Uh, they're so, searching so, so that brings us to the question <coughs> so will they influence i mean will they still you know kind of like keep being an influencer and in changing the society because we're still talking about it. they were the ones who started this whole societal shift and here they have this mm. opportunity so uh, how is it that we live into that new space I think there's two ways in which it can be influential. One is if you think about how many multi-generational households there are now, right? So it was the first sandwich generation where you could be paying to put your kids through college and paying for your nursing home for your parents, mm -hmm. right? So you, you see that there's a, this has started to emerge. And we've also seen this start to extend where you're seeing 
a lot of people, about 60% of the boomers will say that they have an adult, one of their adult children living with them, and about half of them have their own children, right? So you, you've already got the generational synergy, maybe more generational synergy than you want, right? But, yes. you know, it, it is there. <laughs> I think there's a second part of that, though, is you start to think about how this starts to change what's going on. So it gives you a good way to start to have that contact between two or three generations in the same household. Yeah. I think the second thing is that the shift went from, you know, your children who go through college now have an odyssey year, and I think that's almost what now the boomers are looking at when they come out of this, you know, their last right. job, is you're saying, well, what's my next odyssey here? And I think, you know, there's a, there's a similarity inside there that's probably, you know, it's, there's cross-influential things going on because of the multi-generations, but I think, you know, that's what we're going to see going out in the future, is a blending of those influences. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that that blend is also redefining another word, work life. And boomers are moving towards life work, and where there's a blend of work, retirement, and living. Right. And that life work journey, and I love your Odyssey moment. By the way, we, it, it's not cool to say midlife crisis, but midlife rally. Right. Now we're talking. <laughs> and, and so there you have the nuance of that optimism meets the Odyssey, right. that it's so powerful as a communicator in your side of the, of the fence to try, to try to connect with the boomers. And, and millennials are starting off with life work. Yes. So we're trying to move to it. Yeah. They're starting day one, life work. Mm -hmm. And we're like, what's wrong with you? You're, you're not here that long, life work. <laughs> so, so I mean, they're starting exactly. off with the life work mindset because they've seen things. It's yes. like, I need to put something else as a priority. Mm -hmm. Correct. You yeah. know, and, the, and, and they're also dealing with a different turf. So when we came out of school, we are in a different time. I had like 11 job offers. I was yeah. sitting around like, oh, yeah. boy, <laughs> where do I go? You know, the, our kids got to work four interns. You know, it's like they're competing with people my age for jobs. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? They're in a right. very different marketplace. Right. And so they're looking at this thing like, wow, if yeah. I'm going to stay encouraged, I need to create some value in other places That's right. versus the workplace where that was our main place of creating our value. Mm -hmm. So we're coming close to an end, and there's two questions. I want to direct my last question to you, Sharon, uh, because given who our next panel is. But I, as the executive vice president for Multicultural, I want to go back to something that you said, Chuck, which is, I can't lose it, which is that we will start looking more like China, we will start acting more like, like, like Latin America in the terms of speaking to a multicultural, to a nation of distinctions and language. And I'm sort of paraphrasing what you said. But you talked about the influences and in speaking to a multicultural nation. I don't want to lose sight of that because I think that is really clear. So I would love for you to take one minute uh, to sort of like amplify that and talk about the boomers as an influencer and help shaping that, that conversation. Well, the, the, uh, the upheavals in the 60s, the biggest upheavals were around civil rights. Mm. Um, and when you're, on, when you're given a moment of revelation, like a kid who gets shot because he's wearing a hoodie, it's the same moment of, moment of revelation that you get when you see that the army has to turn out and attack a university because a black kid is going to school. So I, I think when you come from that uh, in, in your uh, 20s, uh, teens, whatever, you begin to look at how the society has to shape to, to get along with itself. I mean, we're all a society. We're all in the same boat together. And if we're going to get along together, we have to begin to understand what wearing the hoodie means mm -hmm. and how it, how it cuts a bunch of different ways and isolate the bad ones and focus on the good ones. It just keeps you warm, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> so it was interesting that uh, during that same time, there was this whole advertising in, I think it was Vanity Fair, of, of hoodies for women. And I just, I'm like, oh my god, look at the contrast in time here. Um, and, uh, and just changing a conversation. Well, but I wanted to go back to Sharon, because we were talking about boomers as an influencer and, uh, and this whole you know, multi-generational workplace and homes and m sometimes much to our dismay. <laughs> uh, but do you think that boomers are really the influencers or do you think it's the other way around? I mean, it's particularly we're gonna have a panel mm. that's gonna react to everything that you said. So this is our opportunity to start having those discussions. That's a tough one. I think it's both. Um, you know, when I think about influence, I have to put my marketer hat on because we're obsessed with influence now, right? With mm -hmm. social media. I think before influence might have been what celebrity is going to influence whoever that you wanna talk to, right? And now with social media, it's like, who are the influencers 
as evidenced by how many followers or friends <laughs> or fans that they have, right? So people are very obsessed with that. Like, th I think there's this myth about one influencer figure who makes a lot of people do what they want. Um, but if you look at kind of the new thinking that's coming out of um, um, the guy who works at Google, he's now the user, user experience guy at um, Facebook. His name is Paul Adams. Great book called Grouped. Um, and it's about this notion that everyone is an influencer in their areas of expertise, Absolutely. right? And I think that is kind of a, a concept that we should magnify. And I think in that case, you'll have the boomers with their expertise and millennials and ways that they influence who they're close to in their social networks. And I think that's kind of how the web is kind of evolving. It's very important. It's like the word influence and the word power. Mm -hmm. They're distinct words, mm -hmm. you know? And I think baby boomers have learned to be powerful even without influence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll find the influence to stay in power. Mm -hmm. So if you know something better than I do, I'm hiring you <laughs> so I can yeah. still look good. That's, yeah. a, that's a dynamic around. So the influences in places where we're not influencing, you asked the question earlier, why aren't they targeting us? Because we're not really influencing many times. So that's how we're perceived by advertisers. We're more the power base. Yeah. Like you said, I think we paid a check. <laughs> but my son wants that body wash. I don't, you know, I'm not into that. He's the influencer. And where is the, and so how do we bring those two connections together will be very interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, very interesting. in our generation, we saw a lot of innovation, a lot of novelty coming from younger people, rock and roll, fashion, you know, rebellion, political demonstrations. It was, it was sort of a youth movement. But Steve Jobs recently died, and he was a mature boomer who played a role not unlike Elvis in our society. So mm -hmm. who, how old you are, where you come from, what culture you're from, um, it's, it's become much, there's much more opportunity to be an influencer wherever you are, whoever you are. There, it's easier to get an audience, it's easier to get a, 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 a microphone. Boomers invented youth in a way, or defined it, it's just that now we are reinventing this other stage of life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. And even as Steve Jobs, it's interesting, is he a power player or an influencer? Yeah. Once he got power, he got a whole bunch of smart people working for him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? He may have driven it with his vision. Yes. You see what I'm saying? From a power place and still said, now nah, let's make this vision happen. Let me get the minds around me that can really influence that real change that I see in my vision. So it's, it's, it's a, and, and I, that's generation of synergy to me. That's yeah. what, when I say generation mm -hmm. of synergy, let me do what I do, and if I could do what you do with you and we do it together, mm -hmm. we're so powerful collectively mm -hmm. so versus thinking we're in different places. Steve, Steve Jobs was a great storyteller. Yes, that's you're right. Absolutely, I mean, you talk to people inside <laughs> Apple, when Steve told the story of why this thing had to do this thing in not 15 seconds, but 10 seconds. Yeah. And he said, think about all the time it's gonna save. Put all those five seconds together among all the people in the world, it's a, it's a, it's 100 years. That's how much they're gonna save. That's a story. That's he was wonderful at that. And that's, you know, we, we tell and we listen to our stories. And that's what influence, I, I think, really boils down to, doesn't it? Is that over, overly simplistic uh, I agree. at all? Okay. Yeah, but okay, so what are the channels in which you can, what are the most <laughs> effective channels in which to tell those stories for, for this generation? Yeah, it's interesting, and I think there are a couple of channels. I think email still ends up being a very yeah. powerful one, okay? Yeah. So yeah. we talked about like, you know, how much time everybody spends, wor wor <laughs> how, how much time we spend on our email. But I think it, we're starting to see the social stuff starting to emerge. So if you look at, you know, again, as you said, as boomers begin to understand this probably largely at the tutelage of their own children or grandchildren in terms of you know who they're going to link in with or who they're going to you know, talk to on Facebook or whatever I think you know they will start to, to, to take on the social media a lot more and I think that is where the big opportunity is going to be in the future because again it allows you to do that two-way street that you were talking about before Mila which is like being able to listen to the, 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 the boomers to understand how we need to talk to them yeah. yeah but some of the other mediums are very important particularly if Google just came out with some study yes that it talked about the Hispanic market. Mm -hmm. And the Hispanic market needs to see it on television before they can search mm -hmm. for it yeah. on the internet. And then when they see it in both places, it becomes a, a premium, trustable product for them. And so, and, and right yeah. now, mm -hmm. boomers uh, spend a lot of time on their computer, on their desktop. Um, but th as you say, they're, they're doing 
uh, Google, they're doing a lot of email, Jim. Um, but the marketer that can tell them the story and say, here's the purpose for mm -hmm. Facebook, yeah. here's why you should get involved, is going to win some friendship there. And, and I, and I want to piggyback on that because I think it's purpose meets innovation in the future. I mean, for us to think that we're not going to innovate the next interface, uh, it's wrong. Yeah. Look what's going on with uh, smart televisions coming out now where it's mm -hmm. voice activated mm -hmm. or motion activated. I know, it me well, we know, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you know, that's, that's an issue of convenience and an issue of um, accomplishment and efficiency. Boomers are going to go for that. Yeah. Just yeah. as much as the millennials are going to go at it right. from a different point of view of coolness, we're going to come at it, or boomers are going to come at it from, I don't have to worry about reprogramming that machine again. I just tell it what to do. <laughs> uh, and and that, that is the functionality that you cannot miss as an uh, engineer of, of new product uh, uh, experiences. It's so amazing because when I first heard about that, and this is just a small anecdote, I remember thinking, oh my God, this was the first way I thought of television. Where are the little people, you know, yeah, inside yeah. that <laughs> box? And it just threw me to that when I first yeah. started hearing about that new technology. <laughs> we have a few minutes left, but, um, and I have Fran in my letting me know how much more time we have. I would like to give you one opportunity because the next panel behind us is going to be this youth panel. And although we should not be trying to influence them, this is a good opportunity to spend just one moment and have everyone do sort of like a little round robin as, as to what's the message that we would want to come out of this conversation about mm -hmm. the perspective of boomers and how we would like that to, to close this program. Okay, I'm going to start with you, Marta. Okay. Well, I will borrow generational synergy from Doug. You're cheap. That was easy. Was <laughs> Doug, but yeah. uh, no, but, but I mean, generational and multicultural synergy, but really inclusive. And I will rescue the concept of respecting the differences and understanding how we're enriching the air from a marketing perspective. Doug. Yeah. Um, my son has a business inside of my business called Young Minds, and they do like multicultural and the marketing and the media and all of that. And it's just what I learned from him, and I think what he learned from me and his team, and what we learn from each other is just great. So, generational synergy and just having the I've learned today, just loving conversations with people who are different, mm -hmm. you know, is just an empowering element and. Uh, that way, you f that way you'll find those touch points of what really is valuable for people so you can connect to them and advertise appropriately. Right. Um, optimism. You know, we're, we were, I think, if, if you can attach a, 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 la a label or, or a perspective to us as boomers, it was optimism. And a great philosopher, Yogi Berra, <laughs> <laughs> said, it ain't over till it's over. <laughs> and it ain't. Right. Well, my contribution is going to be that there are multiple rights. And many rights make it even you find the better right. And so that's one of the things that boomers also bring to the conversation is that all of these views of right. I'm going to go with hyper relevance because I think uh, one of the key things we're starting to see in just about every one of these, and it's sort of behind what Emilio said initially, is we think about like how do I make sure that I'm going to communicate with people at the right place, the right time, with the right message. And I think, again, that sounds kind of trite, but what we're starting to see is, and go back to the purpose thing, is that things like mobile are starting to be thought of the same way as packaging or mm -hmm. POS, where people are starting to say, this is something where I can use it immediately to make a decision. So we're, we're, the landscape's changing, and I, so I think there's a big need for hyper-relevance as you go forward, especially to boomers. Yeah, that's it's sort of, is that related to purpose, right? Yes. Yes, <laughs> good. I think marketers can um, think in terms of marketing to each other. In the 90s, when the economy was going crazy, and as Doug talked about, there were job offers all over the place, it was hard to keep people in a company sometimes. And there was the concept of, you've got to market to people. You've got to make it clear to them how it's enriching, how it's a good experience to have this job, and that their contribution is valued. So recognizing the differences, who they are, where they're coming from, what they want, and making, that, uh, ma making the whole experience appealing. Um, really creates a lot of synergy in the organization. And, and, and they should market back to you and show why uh, they're valuable uh, and, and why they're contributing, why it's a good experience to be working with them. If everybody works together like that, then you really have synergy. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go with um, passion points over age mm -hmm. demographics. 
Um, I think that a good example is Weight Watchers, one of our clients. They have a website where you can find people by age or location, and there's some stuff going on there. But the Facebook page for Weight Watchers is actually much more engaging in terms of conversation. I think it's because their people are really just focused on the passion, which is trying to live a healthy lifestyle with what they eat. And so people are talking to each other there around what they're passionate about mm -hmm. versus kind of what defines them by their demographics. So we're going to go to the boomer expert. Uh, Virginia, we're going to well, end there. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going to turn it around. And, <laughs> and for the next panel is don't think of the R word as retirement, but think of relevance. How can I be relevant to my generation? And if the next panel is looking at it, I would, I would add two things to the, the brilliance of this panel is it's about language. And it, it's an optimistic point of view, but it is also about living your best life and, and trying to navigate language and the commonality of the multi-generational approach. And uh, don't miss the fact that the wallet is also quite, quite large <laughs> in, in the generation. <laughs> Good statement. I, I really, I want to thank you, each and every one of you. At first, I thought I was going to have to be a referee, given what we were going through in the green room, but it <laughs> didn't turn out that way. Uh, thank you for your insights. Thank you for participating. I would love to thank our sponsors, um, and hopefully that we will, as boomers on this panel, sans Sharon, um, we could really influence and really have changed this conversation and change the language by which people are talking to the uh, to the boomers. And I'd be very curious as to see what the responders who are much younger than we are will have uh, given our comments. Again, thank you all very much. And um, thank you, Florida, Atlanta, CNN in New York, and all those other places who have joined this conversation. Thank you. Thank you.